We all love bad Christmas movies, and we know why they are bad, but why not look at the glasses half full and discuss the good parts? Let's start off with Santa Claus the movie and find the good parts. With the success of the Superman films, producer Alexander Salkine and his son Ilya decided to retell another origin story. The legend of Santa Claus doesn't begin when Santa's a little baby like Superman was. I guess that's maybe because Santa Claus was never young. The film explored and answered the many mysteries of Santa Claus, including how he came to be the Jolly One, how the reindeer flew, why the elves make toys, and what happens when the elf goes rogue. Santa Claus the movie came out in 1985 and was not successful at the box office and was blasted by critics. I sort of like parts of this movie, but not enough to recommend it. Of course, I might have liked it more if I'd been seven years old, and maybe that's the idea. As a kid, I loved the movie. Now as an adult, it can be difficult to watch. However, there are a few good parts. On Rotten Tomatoes, Santa Claus the movie has a 20% tomato review and an audience score of 66%. Oh, oh that's fantastic. Opinions about what makes a movie bad or good can greatly differ. To help identify the good parts, I am joined by the host of the Behind the Bells podcast, Christmas expert, Robert Nicholas. The podcast takes a deep dive into holiday classics and explores the impact they had on the season. He has graciously offered to help and give his opinion. Welcome, Robert. And now back to the show with our Christmas movie expert, Robert Nicholas. Merry Monday, or Merry whatever day this is. Thanks for having me on. It's not every day that I get to talk about Santa Claus the movie. Unlike the Santa Claus, or even the Santas from Elf, Miracle on 34th Street, and A Christmas Story, this Santa film is rarely ever brought up. I myself happen to be in the love of crowd, even if this is flawed. Those that didn't grow up with it may not realize just how significant it was for the time. Before 1985, Santa had primarily been reserved for classics like Miracle on 34th Street or a matinee kitty fair like Santa Conquers the Martians or Santa and the Ice Cream Bunny. But Santa Claus the movie was one of the first major big budget features to showcase the various aspects of the legend. It was even given the 1980s marketing push of trailers, posters, and even a McDonald's Happy Meal promotion. Ho, ho, ho! When you buy McDonald's Happy Meal featuring Santa Claus the movie, you get one of four full-color storybooks or coloring books. Thank you, Santa! Ho, ho, ho! McDonald's Happy Meal featuring Santa Claus coloring or storybooks. Santa Claus the movie may not be perfect, but I watch it every year, and I am ready to go into it with you, my man. Thanks for joining. Let's propose to each other what we like about the film and see if we agree on the good parts of Santa Claus the movie. The Origin of Santa Claus We've seen numerous origins of Santa Claus over the years. Every film has its own take. Santa Claus the movie keeps it simple. Claus, a toy maker and his wife Anya get lost in a snowstorm up north during the Middle Ages. They are rescued by the elves or Vendigans who believe that Christmas is the chosen one to deliver their toys all around the world. In other words, With great power comes great responsibility. Ah yes, the classic Spider-Man quote. Speaking of superheroes, this is where you can tell that the people who made the first three Superman movies also made this. Santa's origin is a lot like a Kate Crusader. He was a man who was already dedicated to helping children. He was willing to push himself as much as possible getting to these villages and was only given the title Santa Claus when the story felt like he earned it. You will be called Santa Claus. <laughs> yes, there's also an element of the chosen one. This harkens back to the original Christmas story of the nativity in which Mary is taken to Bethlehem and gives birth to Jesus in a manger. Without getting too religious, this gives Santa's story a nice connection. The most humble of toy makers is chosen by an ancient elf to deliver toys. Well, what have they got to do with me? You are going to give them. But how could I deliver all these toys? I won't live long enough for that. 
both of you will live forever. I also really love the first scene in which we get the first hint of the elves, or as you just said, the Vendigum. What's a Vendigum? While the term Vendigum was an invention of the movie, the story being told about them to the village children gives the environment a mystique but relaxed atmosphere. Like a nice Christmas fairy tale you'd hear before going to bed on Christmas Eve, they've been waiting for the right man to eventually come forward. Claus is the chosen one as he understands his responsibility with his great power. Santa's origin story is a good start to the film and a good component of the story. David Huddleston as Santa Claus. David not only looked the part, but his performance makes you believe he's Santa. Watching this film as a child, his performance has stuck with me almost 40 years later. His laugh was jolly and sincere. He cared for the children, including Homeless Joe. And nobody cares about Homeless Joe. While he doesn't get enough story focus to really dive into his persona, he does elicit a lot of joy, even managing to work in a nice ho 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 in his laugh without sounding forceful or even scary. <laughs> He also pulls off the role despite having a more unconventional high-pitched voice, which oddly makes him a lot more relatable. Now, hold on tight and don't worry. You'll be as safe here as you are in your own home. I ain't got a home. Mm -hmm. Looks like we agree. David Huddleston was a great Santa, and of course a Lebowski. John Lithgow as BZ. As sincere as David was as Santa, John Lithgow's portrayal of BZ was the complete opposite, and that is what makes a great adversary. John portrayed BZ as a crazed, money-hungry businessman who enjoys a good cigar and Pep's Blue Ribbon. By next December, they'll be writing to me, <laughs> BZ. It made perfect sense that Santa's enemy would be a corrupt toy builder with dreams of cashing in on the new holiday, Christmas 2. When you got a hit like we have, Patch, the people don't want to wait a whole year, they're dying for a sequel! Christmas 2! Christmas 2? Lithgow's character took the film in a new direction halfway through, and it would have been interesting to see Santa and BZ actually square off. This is where a lot of people usually come from when they say they don't like this movie. They refer to both the overacting of John Lithgow and the fact that he, the main villain, never shares a scene with Santa, the hero. But despite that major flaw, I get what John Lithgow was trying to do. And his performance does come off as a guilty pleasure. Damn it, Towser, get on with your story. Stop giving me all these short sentences and making me go, uh-huh, 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 like some pirate damn moron. Uh-huh. Going back to Superman, Gene Hackman's Lex Luthor was also kind of goofy. I suspect that Santa Claus the movie wanted to recreate that dynamic by letting Santa be the more subtle one, while the villain got to be much more over the top. Oh, look, sir, now he's having a bite. On his own, or with his assistant, or with Patch, John totally steals the show. Some may argue that he's trying to play off something of a Disney villain, but even Disney villains still have fully realized personalities. John is simply an over-the-top villain. He's got the laugh, the cigar chomp, the wide-eyed evil Cheshire cat smile. The only thing missing is a cape. John's performance is so goofy, he's actually quite fascinating. I have a feeling that kids, even modern kids, are going to find him one of the more enjoyable moments against the slower pacing of the rest of the movie. As BZ, John Lithgow plays an exaggerated villain that fits in nicely with this film. The Flying Sleigh Effects after they made Superman fly, the Salkines sought to do the same with Santa's sleigh using practical miniatures. Watching the reindeer gallop in the sky has always looked strange because we don't normally see animals run in the sky. To make it feel real, the effects team was smart and added magical sparkles under the reindeer's hooves. 
It added a bit of mystery and magic and hid any imperfections from the miniatures. I remember being amazed watching this for the first time as a kid. In truth, with the exception of the super duper looper sequence, watching Santa fly around the city still holds up pretty well. What do you think? I'm in the exact same boat you're in. It's a little harder to explain to a more modern audience in which a good chunk of flying effects are done via green screen and CGI. Flying effects were a lot harder to pull off before those luxuries. But the sleigh is awesome proof of what was capable. The sleigh riding sequences, which was a nice mix of miniatures, rear projection, and blue screen, all come off beautifully. I'll say that the first takeoff still takes me back to my childhood, seeing the real reindeer that are pulling Santa before the takeoff. Once it ends up in the air, they use just the right angles and choice of effects to make it convincing. Sure, sometimes the king can be a little off, and some shots are much more obviously miniature, but that's just me being nitpicky. With the exception of maybe the Santa Claus movies and the Christmas Chronicles, I really can't think of that many movies that showcase the flying of Santa's sleigh. And yes, to see a flying sleigh over Manhattan does bring an extra element of storybook quality. The mix of the city lights and a magical holiday entity. It's a good part. The miniature work is spectacular, and the art department and the effects team deserve their recognition. The McDonald's scene. I grew up in the 80s, and I love the McDonald's scene of people eating Big Macs, Chicken McNuggets, and drinking Coca-Cola. It always makes me hungry. Sure, it was a paid product placement, but every time I watch Homeless Joe stare into the McDonald's window, I get nostalgia for the 80s McDonald's brown and yellow decor full of styrofoam containers that are still sitting in landfills today. Nobody feeds Homeless Joe, not even a french fry. With no success at McDonald's, he relies on Cornelia to give him some ham. She also gives him a new Coke that changes into a Coca-Cola classic and then back into a new Coke. Now that is some Christmas magic. Uh. Huh. I've never noticed the Coke can changing. Perhaps Coke was doing everything they can to keep new Coke going as long as possible. Anyway, it's no secret that McDonald's, Coca-Cola, and Blue Ribbon were indicators on who was paying for the production. They were all sponsors helping finance the production. This is nothing new. I have nothing against it as long as it's not too much of an obvious commercial. But here's where we disagree. The Coca-Cola one and even BZ's Pabst Blue Ribbon, that was fine with. People drink both of these all the time. But the McDonald's scene really feels like a dead stop just to get the name brand out. I understand it was done to showcase that Joe can't afford to eat, but that's really it. We never get to see anyone pay off this setup by giving Joe something from McDonald's. I even find it a weird way to market your product. The mouth-watering Big Mac with a savory filio fish and a tasty McChicken. My goodness, that looks good. I really don't have much of a nostalgic eye for that era at McDonald's since I was more of a 90s kid. So I guess it's not a good part. But Robert, I will accept your apology for being born in the wrong year and not having that 80s nostalgia. Of course, maybe I'm just the old man. People know Santa exists. One of my biggest pet peeves about Christmas movies is the story trope where characters don't believe that Santa exists, but are shocked when they learn he does. That's what he asked for in his letter. You mean if a kid writes anything he wants? Joe, didn't you ever write me a letter? Santa Claus the movie is an exception. Nobody questions whether Santa is real or not, except for Homeless Joe. Santa Claus ain't real. In this universe, everybody knows that Santa exists and doesn't question it. If anything, they turn on Santa when Patch's shoddy toys are produced from his failed machine that increases production through automation. Patch failed the big man. Quality assurance is key. Puffy for the win. Yes! As much as I like the Santa Claus, Elf, and many other holiday movies, too many of them fall into this familiar trope. Santa is real. People have clearly grown up with him. They've become parents themselves, 
and yet they somehow think he's not real? Are you him? Are you Santa Claus? Boy, I hate it when this happens. I'm glad Santa Claus the movie doesn't do the typical non-believer plot, or at least for long. Joe may be an exception, but I'd argue that because he's been out on the streets for a long time. Don't you know who I am? Sure, you're a nut. I'm Santa Claus. Right, and I'm the Tooth Fairy. The Molinator. I like it. Going back to what you were saying, I also like that the toys can somehow be returned to the North Pole. This creates a nice connection Santa has with the real world. Children can write to him, the elves read them to Santa, and they do their best to deliver. It's too bad Patch spent all that time building that machine to get more toys out without checking them all to see if they were okay. I'll admit this is another element of the movie that really needed to be rethought. Why would Patch be written as a master craftsman and toy maker, and yet never does he keep up with any maintenance on his own factory machine? It's a good part. Santa is real, but and don't pretend that to be shocked when you didn't know. Robert, what do you propose as some good parts? The music score by Henry Mancini. Now, while Home Alone is probably the best score to a Christmas film, it's too bad that Henry Mancini's music has really fallen off the radar. Its intro and Santa's first arrival sets a nice Christmas mood. The Christmas melody that plays over the time montage is lovely and takes us to a Christmas past the melodies and carols. Henry Mancini is a fantastic composer, and I do agree his score helps make Santa Claus the movie a better film. Your love for John Williams' Home Alone score did the same thing for that film. However, Home Alone was a huge success. My favorite track is Slight Ride Over Manhattan, where Santa takes Homeless Joe on a ride around New York. My only complaint is that the Mancini relied too much on the theme making toys. Henry Mancini's score brings some of these scenes to life, and it's a good part. The design of the North Pole. This definitely defines what I think of of an old world North Pole. Its wooden cabin structure combined that of a giant cuckoo clock makes the whole thing feel like a warm welcome into a much more magical world. I also like how rather than trying to place an enormous metropolis like the Santa Claus or the much more modern Arthur Christmas, this North Pole feels much more quaint and cozy despite being large enough for toy making. The workshop was amazing and clearly where a good portion of the film's budget went. The set designer nailed what most people assume the workshop looks like. You're right, it does feel cozy. In fact, Anya mentions how comfortable their enclosed bed was, and I really want my bed to be like that. I don't want to sleep. This mattress is so comfortable. I don't want to miss a moment of it. The only thing that disturbs me is how the elves use their beards as paintbrushes. How long did it take to paint that place with some beard hair? Let's give some praise to the art department and behind the scenes crew. They deserve their recognition for their good part. The Santa Claus Ceremony Scene. One, Burgess Meredith. Two, this adds a much more mythological depth into how seriously the Vendigum have taken the prophecy without explaining too much. From this day on, now and forever, you will bring our gifts to all the children in all the world. And all this to be done on Christmas Eve. It allows us to bear witness to an ordinary man who is being told by an ancient being that he's officially Santa Claus. This also explains how Santa can travel the world in one night, via time travel of sorts, with the night being endless night until his mission is complete.
bed will know this. Time travels with you. That the night of the world is a passage of endless night for you. It's a rare but needed serious and slow sequence to build on the importance of this moment. I'm going to have to disagree. Nothing against Burgess Meredith, who's a fantastic actor, but the character always felt out of place. If the ancient elf had appeared earlier in the film when Santa is first introduced to the workshop, or followed up with Santa giving him advice how to adapt to the changing world, the character would have worked better for me. The ancient elf wasn't needed. Dooley first greets Chris and Anya and is very personable. I'm the one called Dooley. We've been expecting you. Expecting us? For a long, long time. We almost gave up hope. I would have preferred to see him making the same proclamation and exposition. The ancient elf is like the Emperor in Star Wars. Suddenly he just shows up and is in charge. However, we don't get the scene where Santa throws him down a shaft to save Patch. There is good in him. I can feel it. I'm gonna have to say this is not a good part. Burgess is a great actor, but completely underused. The character of Patch. This is interesting, as I initially didn't care for him as a character. It wasn't until I started to compare him with Buddy and Elf. They're both naive and innocent and want to help spread joy. He does bring a lot of optimism to Patch, which shows us how he would be manipulated by BZ. You do feel sorry for him there, along with the scene when he quits as Santa's apprentice so that he doesn't need to be fired. Patch, how can I say this? You see, I think that, um... Red. Red just, just isn't my color, you know? While the elf puns really don't work. Puffy, the thing about me is that I don't like elf assurance. I'm not afraid to rock the sleigh. Dudley does sell himself as a tinker genius, almost like a proto version of Buddy the Elf. I'm gonna have to disagree with you on Patch. The character has always annoyed me. He took the spotlight away from Santa halfway through the film. He failed to properly do his job, providing quality assurance on the toys his machines produced. Santa was right to fire him and award Puffy the position. After he failed, Patch ran away. He connects with BZ because he was worried about what Santa thought of him and almost ruined Christmas. He claims that he wanted Santa to notice him, but his actions were selfish. His something special was clearly a lawsuit waiting to happen. All a kid has to do is eat too many of them and float away and breathe in space, or eat one too close to the furnace, Ender. and no more kid. There's no more lab. <laughs> oh, the candy canes exploded! They react to extreme heat and turn volatile. We don't agree on the character of Patch, but I think we can agree that Dudley Moore is elftastic. Santa Claus the Movie is not a well-reviewed film and has a lot of flaws. It has its problems, but we both agree that the origin of Santa Claus, David Huddleston as Santa, John Lithgow as BZ, the flying sleigh effects, people knowing that Santa exists, the music score by Henry Mancini, and the design of the North Pole are all good parts to this film. We don't agree that the McDonald's scene, the Santa Claus ceremony scene, or the character of Patch are good parts. Obviously, these are our opinions, but we agree that the behind the scenes crew created the magical world with a few good performances. Robert, I want to thank you for joining in this important discussion on the good parts of Santa Claus the movie. Where can people find you? You can find my podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible, and YouTube in case anyone here doesn't podcast. You can also find me on Facebook, Instagram, Reddit, and TikTok. Just type in behind the bells, and once you've found my cartoon face, you've gone to the right place. So those are the good parts of Santa Claus the movie. Have an idea for a future episode? Leave a comment below. We will see if there are any good parts in the next episode, featuring the terrible Christmas movie Single Santa Seeks Mrs. Claus, with my special guest hit or miss Hallmark reviews. Click on the subscribe button to be alerted when that episode is released if you want to find out. I'm the Christmas aficionado, and remember, stay off the naughty list. 
You don't have any parents. So, meh. Ow. Oh, hi. Oh, hi.